Knowing who to contact and when is pretty important. In our case at NCSA, identifying when to contact and put into motion our internal IT incident response team is important. But we also have to consider when we let the campus folks know about what's going on. We try to do that fairly early, especially so we can find out if there are any related problems that we might need to be aware of. Our incident might be part of a much broader incident and we need to be aware of other activities that might be going on that will impact our response. Letting organizational leaders know about the incident is another consideration you need to make. The lead on the incident should have this information laid out in the response plan. Here at MCSA, usually our incident response lead is notified right away, and he will notify the director of site security and a few other people. Then, as a group, they will decide who and when people up the chain need to know things. At a minimum, once we know it is a security incident, we usually have to notify our organizational leads up through site directors. The other thing that needs to be decided is how much and what kind of information to give them. Unfortunately, we can't give you a flowchart that tells you who and when to communicate with people. It's a hard thing to decide. But we have found that over communicating is usually better than holding back, at least with members of your project and organization. Take the time to explain to them what you know so far and to make sure you clearly define what role you want them to play. If you need them to make decisions or give instructions, make sure they understand that is what is expected. When you come down to it, that is really all organizational leads really want to know what is expected of them. What decisions do they have to make? So clearly, as in our case, different people, different projects, manage different resources and systems within our organization. Most likely your situation is the same. In these cases, you need to notify them fairly early on that something is going on. We have made mistakes in the past where we chased everything down and figured things out, but forgot to contact the resource owners. Not surprisingly, they were very upset about this. It's not surprising, even though we did all the right things as for the incident. We contained it and eradicated it and restored, but they didn't even know we were doing things in their resources. So make sure you contact them early on in the game and make sure that is spelled out in your procedure. Put network and system administrators on alert that you're doing things. A lot of times they will offer to help with things they can do, this may or may not be helpful to you, but it is critical to inform them since those systems are theirs. Also, you poking around and doing things might trigger alerts that they need to know about. The same thing is true for owners of applications. Most likely, you will be bringing systems on and offline. You might be starting and stopping services, so people need to be aware of this. Project leads, like organizational leads, need to be kept in the loop. If you need a decision from them, make sure you clearly communicate that to them. If things reach a certain level of criticality, you might have to let the higher ups on campus and in your organization know about things. Even in the last year here at MCSA, we've had to let the university provost know about an incident that was going on. Luckily, we don't have to report to them directly, but we do have to give the information to our upper management who will be reporting to the provost. This will most likely be important if the incident is something that could affect the name and reputation of the university. It is not uncommon that when things escalate to that point, that these upper level people start calling the shots on how things will proceed. Your plan should also specify how other sites you might be working with on your project get notified. You need a plan for contacting users too. The results of the incident might affect all of these people. So you should know how contact will be made with them. Contacting law enforcement might be trickier. Oftentimes, this will be guided by procedures from outside your project. Make sure you are aware of what those procedures say. As we mentioned earlier, here at NCSA, we cannot directly contact law enforcement. That type of contact has to go through university legal, and they will tell us what we can and cannot say. Most often the reverse is true too. Law enforcement cannot come and talk to you directly either. They need to go through legal. So make sure you know what the procedures are for your organization and include those in your response plan for the project. 
media contact is probably even more controlled than law enforcement. Clearly, when media finds out about things, you want to know what you can and cannot say. Different organizations get touchy about different things. Make sure you take all of that into account and clearly define a media policy as part of your plan. When talking about team coordination and communication, as we mentioned earlier, it's important to identify the leader. Back in the early days, before incident response became a more formal affair, it was not uncommon for a team of administrators to work a problem without any defined leader. The results were usually poor. You had multiple people trying to lead things and going off in different directions, and things taking a lot longer than they should. We've learned from this, and I'll always make sure people know who is in charge. Understanding who is authorized to make a decision helps with the whole process of incident response. It is not uncommon for several people to have the authority to take the system down. A department director, a site director, and a project PI might all have the authority to authorize the system to be brought down. But which one should you talk to? And which should you get the permission from? How do you decide? There should be guidance for this in your plan and for your team. It seems like incidents always happen when your team is not around. They happen at night when everyone is home, or over the holidays when no one's working. How are you going to deal with that? What is the communication plan for the team? What if the attack is a denial of service attack? How will your team get to the data they need if they can't get to your site? It is these kinds of things, and the question of how do you communicate with your team members, and they amongst themselves, that you need to establish. What is the process that they will follow? What about external entities, other groups or organizations you work with, or services you might hire, like outside consultants? Who are those? What do you need to tell them? And who's going to do that? These are things that your team needs to be aware of and understand. Developing external relationships is another key part of your incident response strategy. Your campus IT department is a good one to work with. If they have an incident response team or a security team, you should learn who they are. If you have an incident, they can become really important. Knowing who the members of these external teams are is pretty important before you have an incident. If you already have a relationship with them, it really helps things along when you have a problem. What these external relationships come down to is knowing who to contact and how to contact them. You might not need to know everyone, but you should know who to contact. You don't need to have a relationship with the university provost, but you should know someone who does. Plus, you want these people to know about you so that you can get help from them right away and not waste time in introductions. The more people you know or know how to contact is just an advantage. Each of these people can all help out in different ways. So make some effort to start developing relationships so that you'll have these resources at your disposal. Information sharing agreements are another important item you need to have. These guide you in knowing how much information you're going to share and with whom. They also guide you in what mechanisms will be used to share that information. Will it be via email or over phone? As stated, these also guide you in how much and what kind of information you can share with them. What are the security considerations that go into sharing that information? Does the data need to be anonymized or encrypted when shared? If you give information away and the bad guys find out about it, does that put you in a worse situation than you were before? Or does it make the PR problem you're having worse? These agreements help you understand and define these kinds of issues. Then what kind of reporting requirements do you have? For example, here at NCSA, if we have an issue with blue waters, we need to inform NSF right away. If you don't understand these requirements, you might find yourself in a lot of trouble in the midst of your incident. If you decided to shut the system down and don't know all the stakeholders you need to contact, this might cause a problem. Someone from NSF might be calling you because they're very unhappy. Each NSF-funded project probably has a program manager they deal with. Now, this program officer might or might not care about you reporting to them, but you should know that. And at a minimum, you should have some kind of plan in place to direct how and when they should be communicated with. 
This is true for all of the stakeholders in your project. Something we don't all do as much as we should. Let's practice these things. You can conceptualize out what it's like to do an incident response, but you don't actually know until you run through one. You will find out during your first one that you'll run into all kinds of problems and things don't go the way they're planned. So run through some test cases first. You can run through a number of them in an hour or so. Hypothesize on situations that might arise and then go through what you would do to respond to them. Get your team together in a conference room and with everyone sitting around with the plan, go through some of the scenarios you come up with. Use the plan to see how it works. Go through what each member would do and see if things work. See what kinds of problems you run into. It also helps your staff become more aware that they are on this team and get an understanding of how it functions. These kinds of exercises also help them take their responsibilities more seriously. It's hard to feel like something is important if nothing's going on with it. By having walkthroughs and test runs, it shows the members that the activity is important and worth putting some effort into. Another area that is helped by you running incident response tests is that of your disaster recovery program. It is very rare that your recovery plans get tested. Often people don't find out there are problems with the recovery plan until they need it, and then it's too late. More often than not, as part of your response to an incident, you will have to recover your system from backups. So when you are testing your incident plan, it's a good time to test your recovery plan too. You don't want to get bitten during the incident and find out things you thought were supposed to be on tape are really not there or have been corrupted. These tests don't have to be anything elaborate. They can be as simple as running through your procedure to make sure they still make sense, but they are something you should do. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website TrustedCI.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI 1234408.